This week we are studying the form and function of cellular membranes. Cell membranes offer protection to the cell by isolating the cell contents from the surrounding environment. This means that any particle that needs to go inside the cell or outside of the cell has to go through the plasma membrane. And any interaction with the external environment has to occur at, with the plasma membrane or at the plasma membrane. And for this reason, the plasma membrane contains multiple types of proteins whose function is to help the cell interact or perform activities in the external environment. For example, types of proteins that are present in the plasma membrane are transported proteins that allow the passage of molecules that are either too big to diffuse across the plasma membrane or cannot pass through it because they will be um, repelled by the known polar region in the uh, inside the bilayer. There are also proteins that act as there are enzymes that catalyze reactions in the perimeter of the plasma membrane. There are other proteins that act as receptors so that they recognize and bind to signaling molecules that are circulating outside of the cell. There are proteins that convey the identity of the cell and this will become very important for immune function and it can also it's also very important during the process of development and cellular differenti differentiation. There are also proteins that allow the cells to adhere to one another and also the ones that help um, attach to the cytokeleton filaments to help give a structure to the cell and there might also be a combination of the last two where they attach to the cytoskeleton and they also attach to surrounding cells. We're going to take a closer look at how cells move molecules across the, and how things, how molecules move across the membrane. So there, there is a possibility of molecules simply diffusing through the plasma membrane and this will be particularly for, for proteins that are lipid soluble, such as uh, steroids that are derived from cholesterol or fatty acids. Those can just simply um, diffuse through the plasma membrane. But other proteins that cannot diffuse through the plasma membrane, such as polar proteins, such as ions, or proteins that are too large to diffuse through the plasma membrane, such as glucose, they need special transported proteins uh, that will let them go through. Now, those transported proteins can allow for simply diffusion. They can be just like pores, like this molecule we're looking at here is an aquaporin, which allows the passage of water. Water cannot easily diffuse through the plasma membrane. Some of it can, it can sporadically, but it's not a very efficient way. So aquaporins allow water molecules to, to move in and out of, of the cell. For example, this one. And uh, so this will be uh, a type of protein that is facilitated diffusion. You're gonna see this in the other resources that we have available. Other proteins allow the passages the passage of uh, molecules against the concentration gradient that is from low concentration into higher concentration and that will require the expenditure of energy as you're going to see in the, for example, the sodium potassium pump that is in your textbook. So let's see what is the difference between diffusion and osmosis. Let's start with a container and let's assume it's filled with pure water. And we have it divided by a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable means it might allow the passage of some type of molecules, but not all of them. And when you're thinking of molecules in a solution, just as gases in the air, these molecules are not fixed. They are in constant motion. So think of it as they're constantly moving. And as they move, one of those molecules may eventually cross the membrane and they might cross in either direction and they will keep moving and some will pass in one way, the other one will pass in another way. But at the end, it will be amount, about the same amount of molecules that are passing in one direction versus the other direction. So there will be no net movement of water in either direction. And this will result that your, as you can see, the water levels at both sides of the membrane are about the same. So there is not net, not net movement, even though molecules are constantly moving in both ways. Now we add, let's add a glucose to 
one side of the membrane and this is a semi-permeable membrane that um, allows glucose molecules to go through. Now we have a higher concentration of glucose on side A of, the, of our container than what we have on side B where we have no glucose at all. And uh, so this, this semi-permeable membrane would allow, can allow the passage of water molecules as we saw and also of glucose molecules. So what we see is just as the molecules of water move, the glu glucose molecules will move too. And as they move around, one glucose molecule may eventually cross the semi-permeable membrane. So let's do a replay. And then they will keep moving and then eventually two molecules might cross and this will keep going and they can keep moving back and forth. But the net, the, until there is there is not net movement because the concentrations are the same, so it's just as likely that one molecule inside A will move to side B as there is the possibility that a molecule inside B will move to side A. So this means that even though the molecules are moving back and forth, there is no net movement of, of the molecules and the concentrations at this point have equilibrated. That means there is almost as much glucose inside A as there is inside and B. And this is this process is called diffusion. Glucose diffused from an area of high concentration when we first put it inside A to a concentrate uh, an area of lower concentration of size B when there was no no glucose present and now now they equilibrate it. So like just like I mentioned before, it's not only solids in solution, also gases diffuse. Um, this is, for example, how oxygen diffuses from high concentration in the air into your blood that has a lower concentration of oxygen. So now let's see what would happen if the membrane does not allow the passage of glucose. So now this membrane has the pores are too small for glucose to pass through. What would happen in that case? So now we have a new semi-permeable membrane, still semi-permeable, still allows some molecules to go through, smaller molecules such as water molecules, but not glucose molecules which are much larger. So now we add glucose on the same side of the container and let's see um, what would happen. So this means that now the area that has glucose has become hypertonic, this has a higher concentration of solute then the side that has no, no glucose is hypotonic. It has a low concentration or a lower concentration of solutes than, than we have on side A. And this means that now, since glucose cannot pass through, as you can see, this is to show you that the pores are too small for glucose, the glucose molecule to diffuse, now water will have to try to balance out the concentrations. So in what direction do you think water will move? Even though we have apparently the same, the same number of water molecules on either side, the proportion of water molecules to the overall number of molecules is not the same. So here we have a solution that is 100% water, but here it's actually about 66% are molecules of water and the other are molecules of, uh, of glucose. So what water will try to do is now move from the hypotonic area into the hypertonic to try to equilibrate the solute concentration so that both solutions will be in equal solid concentration and that is isotonic. So water will move from the hypotonic into the hypertonic solution. And as it moves, since there is, since there is a it's a net movement now from water moving from side B into A. This means that we're going to have a decrease in water level. And water will continue to move from the hypotonic solution into the hypertonic until either both solutions have similar concentrations so that they're isotonic or something else stops the water from moving, such as, for example, the pressure of... Um, of side A becoming 
higher than what side B is. It has a higher pressure. Here, this, this water here, the weight of this water here will cause pressure pushing down so that no more water will move from the, from the hypotonic solution. That's an example. Or if, if there is nothing to limit it, water will keep going in until, until something happens, such as, for example, the cells burst. And this is why we see in red blood cells. So when we put red blood cells, in this case here, in a hypertonic solution, a solution that has a higher concentration of solids than what the cell has inside of it, water will move out of the cell. It will leave the cell and as a result the cells will shrivel. Normal red blood cells, when they're circulating in plasma, plasma has an isotonic, it's an isotonic uh, solution in relation to the red blood cells. So as a result, that's how um, they can keep a balance and they can keep their shape because they are in a solution that has the same concentration of solids as they have inside of them, so they are isotonic. If we place them in a hypotonic solution, such as for example, pure water, distilled water, now water will rush inside of the cell and it will keep moving inside the cell until the cells swell and they burst, until they cannot hold all the water that is coming in. Some uh, cells, such as for example plant cells or um, fungi cells and the bacteria, are surrounded by a rigid cell wall and this cell wall will cause pressure that will prevent the cell to keep expanding once they're placed in a hypotonic solution so that it will uh, prevent the water to keep moving, to keep coming inside the cell and it will prevent the cell to burst. And this, the pressure that it creates is called turgor. This is very important in plant cells. So when we have a plant cell in a hypertonic solution, it will just shrivel just as an, an animal cell. If they are in an isotonic solution, it will just be a balance of water coming in and out of the cell. And when they're in a hypotonic solution, water will keep moving into the cell until the pressure of the, of the cell wall will prevent any more water from entering the cell. And that is what we call turgor. It is important to note that the concepts of hypertonic and hypotonic are really only useful in relation to another solution. You cannot say a solution is forever hypertonic. If, if you place the hypertonic solution next to a solution that has even higher concentration of solids, now the hypertonic will be called hypotonic. So it's always in relation between two things. So when we were talking about the cells, is the, the solution inside of the cell in comparison to the solution outside of the cell. So, um, for example here, if we now add another type of molecule, for instance sucrose, to the other side, to side B, and we added that such as there are more molecules of sucrose than what there are molecules of glucose on the other side. Now side B has become hypertonic and side A is now hypotonic. So um, it's also important that you notice that hypertonic and hypotonic doesn't have to be necessarily the same molecule. So for example, cells can maintain an isotonic solution in comparison to their external environment but they don't necessarily have to keep the same type of molecules inside of them than what you find in the external environment in order to be isotonic. They can keep a different type of, of molecules as long as, as the uh, osmolarity is similar. So now that this water, uh, this solution inside B is hypertonic, and glucose, neither glucose or sucrose can move across the membrane, now water will have to, to move, just as in the previous example. So now water will move from the hypotonic solution on side A into the hypertonic solution on side B. If the membrane now allows the passages of both solids, so now we have a different type of membrane, now this membrane has big pores that allows 
both glucose and sucrose to pass by to diffuse through it, now is a different thing will happen. Now if the solids can pass through the membrane, now they will be they will diffuse following their gradient until the concentrations until they have similar concentrations. So this is the case here where where um now we have equal similar concentrations of sucrose on either side as we have similar concentrations of glucose on either side. So just to recap the uh, the ways that living organisms can maintain osmotic balance or do osmoregulation are, are quite variable. For example, protist, as this paramecium here, has contractile vacuoles, as we have pointed here, and this Contractive vacuoles, they collect the excess of water that enters the cell. So the, uh, the cell is hypertonic in relation to the external environment, so water is always coming inside the cell and is collected in these vacuoles. And then periodically, these vacuoles pump the excess of water back into the external environment. Other organisms and other cells, for example, such as red blood cells we talked about, they make their internal... Um, osmotic pressure equal to that of the external environment. So that is, they are isotonic and therefore there is no net movement of water in either direction. Other organisms, like we talked, as plants and bacteria and fungi, have a cell wall that produces a pressure and prevents the water from coming inside the cell. So these are the ways in which organisms can regulate osmotic balance. And with that, now you can go and review the other resources that we have available.